In this lesson, we're looking at evolution and phylogeny. So we are reminding ourselves of some phylogenetics so that we can interpret data. Right, there's a huge amount of evidence to support the theory of evolution that all of life has descended from a common ancestor. So we ourselves have evolutionary relationships with every other organism and at some point shared a common ancestor. So scientists group the evidence that supports the evolutionary theory into some loose categories. So the fossil record is number one and it shows some evidence that modern organisms show changes and progression from the types of organisms that were around in the past and biogeography or biogeographical evidence that organism distribution follows some really logical patterns that make sense when we consider the movements of the tectonic plates throughout the Earth's history. We also look at comparative anatomy so that we can see that many organisms share basic structural forms. So, for example, we're talking homologous features and the bones in the limbs of a human and a dog and a bird and a whale all share the same overall construction. These are homologous features. So while over time they have changed to adapt to their environment, right, and they're all going to have very different environments, they have the same basic layer, which is more of an indication of a common ancestor. Even when animals have no use for certain structures, they still carry evidence of this past ancestor, and these are known as vestigial structures. So, for example, snakes and whales, they still have a tiny little pelvis bone, right, a pelvic bone, but large flightless birds, they still have wings, blind animals that live in the dark still have eyes, and our appendix, our tailbone, right, the coccyx, our wisdom teeth, um, and the ability to get goosebumps when we're cold, they're all carryovers from our ancestors, you know, some might be recent, some might be very long ago. Now, embryology also supports those ideas of comparative anatomy and gives some clues to our shared history. All vertebrate embryos, for example, you know, have gill slits and tails, but most, except for, say, fish, lose their gill slits by adulthood. So some of them also lose their tail, like in humans, our tail is reduced to just that tiny little tailbone. And in essence, we all start off looking indistinguishable from one another. But not all physical features can truly point to some evolutionary history, right? Some features evolve in organisms through sheer necessity. Similar ecosystems would require similar traits among many types of organisms. So marine environments need animals to be streamlined, cold environments need animals to be warm, dry environments need organisms to conserve water, right? Makes sense. Structures that evolve to do a similar job that occur in organisms without shared evolutionary history are called analogous structures, okay? And these are different from homologous structures, which actually do indicate that shared history. So initially, all scientists had to go off were these external observable features, right, the physical features of an organism. But as we gained more knowledge about genomes and molecular sequences, molecular biology better supported the search for some shared ancestry. So comparative molecular biology uses the same, same principles as comparative anatomy, but it does so with far better precision and accuracy. If we're comparing DNA sequences or amino acid sequences in proteins, this is a truer indication that there is evolutionary relatedness, and there's no mixing up analogous features for homologous features. So basically, because we have more precise and accurate information now, scientists are able to confirm or disprove relationships and classifications that they'd already postulated about and debated about. And they continue to do so, right? And we can see this in the news quite frequently. So more information available, the more clearly we can classify organisms in relation to one another, since we know more about their shared ancestry. To analyze data, we reveal phylogenetic, or to reveal, sorry, phylogenetic relationships, we have to first remind ourselves about phylogeny and cladistics. Now, phylogeny is the history of the evolution of a species or group with references to the lines of the descendant and relationships among broad groups of organisms. Phylogenetics seeks to discover the evolutionary history and the relationships among living species, while cladistics is the kind of classification arm of that. So while our goal is to discuss evolutionary histories, we need to remember a few of the widely accepted assumptions of our cladistics, and that is that all life evolved from a common ancestor, that the offspring diverge from the parent's characteristics in a dichotomous way, and that organisms evolve and change physical characteristics compared to their ancestors. So 
With these assumptions, we use, you know, an organism's homologous features as clues to their shared ancestry with other organisms, and we use molecular phylogeny to compare the DNA sequences and the proteins to further classify and narrow down their evolutionary journey. So it's not as simple as just using the DNA sequences. We can be talking about the amino acid sequences and the proteins that we're comparing. We can be talking about conserved genes and mitochondrial DNA as well to make judgments and draw conclusions. And we can visually organize all that kind of stuff in a phylogenetic tree.